glad to see so many people interested in young folks. Uh, the problem we are to address this morning has to do with the changes in the, re, in the development of methodologies for the training of young people. Actually, as we all remember, uh, there were days when family life provided a great deal of strength to the members and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. But all this is more or less changed. The great modifying or regulating intensities of the moment are in the hands largely of peer groups of young people themselves and the media. Instead of the individual growing up in a home, he is largely growing up in a pandemonium. Now this does not mean there are not good homes, but it means there are not enough of them. Enough to meet the balance of the changes that society has brought about in the last few years. We think of change in the wrong way usually. We think of change as something that happens and then things more or less settle back and go on as they always were. But this is not true. All change of major importance has an enduring effect and very often changes the entire course of the future of a nation or a uh, family. The main problem we, we see in such things is the invention of the automobile. The Ford car didn't seem particularly dangerous to anybody. Many thought it would be pretty good to get away from the cruelty to animals of the old days of trucking. No one thought of it except as an invention. But there isn't a single step of history since the invention of that car that has not been influenced and modified by it. Today, as we look at the freeways, they are the long shadow of Ford's flipper. They are something that inevitably happened as a result of a single incident that changed the course of history. Another one of these history-changing incidents was the aeroplane. This has, to a somewhat lesser degree, affected civilian life, but it has had a tremendous impact upon military uh, procedures. The media, television, motion pictures, each of these things was considered to be something interesting in itself. People became very much involved with it, but no one realized, actually, that the world would never be the same once these inventions come into use. They change the future. They require not only a well thought through plan, but they demand from every human being major modifications in personal conduct. The individual can no longer live the way he lived before these changes came about. And in the present century, the rate of change has escalated tremendously. In the year 1900, things were not so different than the way they were in 1850. But by 1950, the change in the century, the whole past had been changed, modified, and a large part of our common policy, conduct, and code became obsolete. Now, in the 16th and early 17th century, Comenius, the Moravian educator, established the concept of the public school. Prior to that time, most schools were in the keeping of the church or of guilds, or for the education of the children of the nobility. Comenius was the one who told Europe that the educational system had to be changed that there was absolutely necessary for someone, something, some way to protect the moral growth of children. He suggested as the most reasonable point of view 
that those best fitted to tell children the facts of life were their own parents. And in those days this was probably true, for there was comparatively little that was unusual in the life of the individual. He grew up in a community, lived and died there. He perpetuated the business and policies of his fathers and grandfathers. And he bestowed these concepts, opinions, beliefs and properties upon his children. This has completely changed. Now this change has brought to focus a number of points that we like to ignore. We like to assume that things will go on as they always have and that the present will not change the future. That the future that we look for could be 16th or 17th century. But if we want it, we can have it. But the truth is we can't. We cannot go back to a way of life with which we are no longer in any harmony or understanding. So we now had the problem of Comenius and trying to find some way to do something for the public school system. When he came along, there wasn't any. So there were many ways of improving it. But there was a definite pattern of processes. Children learn at home, for the most part. A child in a farming community in 1840 or 50 received only a few months schooling a year. The rest of the time the child had to work on the farm with its parents. So the desires of education were simple and the final end of education was reading, writing, and arithmetic plus integrity. The schools or the parents' guilds or whatever constituted education provided the three R's. The only other factor possible was religion. The local church had to do with the spiritual destiny of the farmers and merchants of the communities. This church had as its primary instruction ethics, integrity, and the recognition of a divine power that must be obeyed. This was not difficult to believe in times when there was no real Darwinism in circulation. There were very few agnostics and practically no atheists. The families themselves had religious background. Of course, it would be noticeable then as now that these families did not live their religion too well. They accepted it, supported it, and affirmed it, but largely lived according to the pressures of their own personalities. So uh, Comenius thought the possibility of what was called the mother school, in which the child learned first that which was of most importance, eth ethics and integrity. It was far better for the child to be a good person than to have a fantastic education which he was going to abuse. Also, no matter how much knowledge descended upon him in the course of centuries, he was still in a position to control that knowledge by ethics. Therefore, the individual had a first line of defense in the ethical instruction which was part of his environmental support. This is largely done away with at the present time. The mother school of uh, Comenius faded away into the public school system. And the public school system has continued to grow in influence. But for some reason that is hard to define, the entire ethical structure has collapsed. It has vanished, faded away. The reason it has faded, no question, is that the success mania, wealth and power and fame have become the principal objectives of human life. Now, not long ago, we, have, we had an experience, or the world had an experience, of people who developed 
unfortunate narcotic habits and perfectly knowingly and well informed killed themselves in a few years. Why? Because there was no perspective on life. There was no preparation for adversity of any kind. There was no directive to inspire the individual to rise above his own pleasures and his own conveniences. The educational system came to a dead standstill. Actually, I read a couple of days ago in a, a recent public scientific publication that, as usual, the Japanese are trying to do something about it. And they are realizing definitely that the great economic empire they're build, they building up is suspended from one single thread. And if anything happens to that thread, all is lost. And that thread is honor. No matter how much you build, you're going to have strikes, you're going to have all kinds of inferior productions, self-centeredness, conspiracies, and terrorism. As long as success regardless of methodology is the only objective now what is public school doing about that what school is teaching the individual to build that type of character which can resist the pressure of a peer group rise above the pressures of the media and live a decent life we are going further and further into the depths of science. We are trying to discover more and more about the cellular construction of this and that and something else. But we are allowing these young people to graduate in science without the slightest sense of understanding of integrity. And we are not waking to the fact that without integrity all else is going to fail. We are not putting principles to work in people. We are not doing the things uh, that will uh, ensure that we're going to move into the next century with a reasonable degree of security. Now we know these things are happening, but we know that people can do something about these things. And many people think with Comenius that the real place where the young people should gain integrity is at home. That they can never be taught anything as powerful as good example. If the family they admire, if the parents they respect, are worthy of their understanding and cooperation, there is a good probability that the child will be strongly influenced by that and will keep a certain amount of honor. Now the science is approaching this in a little different way. It has gone into heredity. It has tried to prove that the attitudes that we cherish today descend to us through the bloodstream and that the individual is the production of generations of forebears and ancestors and that all this adds together to make a complex character or personality with which the individual now must struggle for the rest of his life. What he inherits is a problem, and in many cases a disaster. So we don't, we're not sure anymore uh, that it is possible to assume uh, that we can depend upon the family or society or education or even religion to make sure that our young people grow up with a certain degree of decency. We need this strength, but where is it? So uh, we come to another interesting problem. How does the individual fit into this? The Bible says, as the twig is bent, so the tree is inclined. Now this is true and was more true in olden days. But now there's something else creeping into this equation which we have not considered. How is the twig bent? Is it really bent by early life? Is the family situation the source of the characters, temperaments, and personalities with which we must go through life? There seems to be some doubt of this. 
A family of five children, all in the same home, with the same parents, do not develop in similar ways. Out of those five, several, two or three, may do very well. But of those five, we're almost certainly going to find one neurotic. <laughs> or we're going to find one bitterly com competitive. competitive. We're going to find one more violent and another more sulky. We're going to find one that is optimistic by nature and another who is always drenched in their own pessimism. Now, if they all came from the same family, they all grew up in the same home, they all had the same opportunity, why are they so different? They have all been subject to the same twig bending, but they've had very different lives. Now, there are several possibilities that have not yet been thoroughly explored in this matter. One of the possibilities, of course, that is now coming into focus is prenatal trauma. In other words, the condition of being born can be very difficult, although the infant has no conscious memory of it. The problems of the mother prior to the birth of the child can certainly have a conditioning effect, first chemically and then psychochemically. The actual problem of coming into this world can be painful and, and terrifying. So there is a little discussion now as to how to ease that situation. One of the new ideas in this field is water birthing, in which children born in or very near the surface about underwater seem to have less trauma and the mother less difficulty. This would or might indicate that the child's subconscious will have less of fear and therefore will not come into this world dreading it before it gets here. Or has the first life experience is pain, suffering, trouble, inconvenience, and a very often a weak family background behind it. Now another point comes into this problem which not generally receives much consideration. If the law of reincarnation is correct, and, and as many who believe it very devoutly and have a lot of supporting evidence, then the individual does not come into the world brand new. The child is not a handful of putty that is going to depend entirely upon being molded and modeled by parental or environmental pressures. The child brings its disposition with it. Now if we assume that nature has a pattern of, of laws operating, it is quite reasonable to assume that these patterns are operating within the child that it is born to a destiny or a purpose. It is born to enlarge a, an area of knowledge and correct an area of foolishness or mistakes. It is here to grow and to learn. Now, the learning does not have to be painful. This does not take away the parental uh, participation in this affair. But supposing we say, for example, that one of the five children in the family is obviously much more serious, um, uh, much more uh, aloof from worldliness than the others. This child is just as easily handled by family understanding as long as the parents do not personally have an antagonism to the attitude that the child is born with. If a parent is very selfish and self-centered, and the child is naturally generous and altruistic, it becomes the moral duty of the parent to change the child. The child being too young to be able to change the parent, and because these rules do not work both ways, that is almost inevitably going to result in trauma for the child. 
and the adult will always assume that he or she is right. The adult has a background of practical world experience which it feels necessary to communicate to the child. No one pauses to find out what this adult attitude really has accomplished for the adult. Is the individual who knows all the answers living any better than the individual who doesn't know the answers? In many instances, if these answers are purely materialistic and are based largely upon concepts of wealth and security, the advice given to the child is comparatively worthless. It will produce for the child the same thing it may produce for the adults, and that is a divorce. They are not as able to solve it this way. Therefore, as the family breaks down, as home life is disrupted, as economic pressures increase, as the cost of doing almost everything is multiplied, the influence of the parent on the child is not nearly as constructive as it was when that same attitude was supported by the community, the religion, and the school. The parent now stands alone trying to hold the line against a generation of disillusion, disillusioned young people. Young people who, looking around, come to the very painful but realistic re uh, attitude that why should they follow systems, ideas, and policies which have brought their own ancestors to the brink of extinction. This type of thinking has to have something done to work with it. Now, the, the possibility of the loss of home life is now moving into another cycle. And like the invention of the Ford car, this cycle is not going to merely produce an equality in economics. It is going to change the history of the world uh, as long as the foreseeable future. Now, this does not mean that the change will be bad, but it is a change that must be adjusted to, and the failure of adjustment is going to result in generation after generation of underprivileged children. The adjustment is this, that survival in our present economic pressure is demanding a two-income family. It means that both parents must work. Now, as far as we are able to say this matter, certainly both parents are privileged to work. There should be no uh, effort to disparage this right. The individual is an individual. The father is an individual and the mother is an individual. But the problem that results from all this situation is what is going to happen to the third individual, the child. Now, the as gradual disappearance of the home may be good in the long run, but it is going to present some terrific problems. It is going to confront us with a new way of life that is going to touch every nation on earth, every art and science, every economic structure, every religion. Things will never be as they were before. And in this we have one point of insecurity which we have to, must do something with. And that is that the loss of the home leaves the newborn child or the very young child on the horns of a dilemma. Years ago, when it was necessary for single parents to work, a grandfather, a grandmother, an aunt, or an uncle could step in, or would. But today this is no longer feasible. These older people have their own lives and are perfectly convinced that destiny intended them to be just as successful as they could be under any possible opportunity. Therefore, the idea that they are going to sit home and allow the young people to go out and accumulate their fortunes or at least accumulate the payment on the house. This is not going to happen. And in the midst of this, we have the child. What are we going to do about this? How are we going to change this? Well, in some of the socialized countries, 
The state takes over the parental responsibilities of the young. The children become wards of the state and are given certain visitation privileges with their parents, but all their necessities and all the way of life is in the hands of the social system. Now this has certain advantages, certainly. It makes certain that the child is not left alone in a dangerous situation, but it also opens the way for the indoctrination of that child with whatever political or religious attitudes dominate the social system. It means that the individual is going to be gradually transformed into a unit in a collective attitude, whether this be a, a financial attitude, a social, or a political attitude. This means that the child now has an early environment, and the twig is being bent by the prevailing political system. Now this uh, seems maybe could be very good. It might account in many ways for an improvement in the condition of the underprivileged levels of society. It could help to prevent hunger and sickness among the young. It could do a great deal uh, to free parents to what? Not to a life of their own, but to a continual employment in the system. The parent does not get rid of a responsibility when the society takes over the child. He is simply privileged to take on more of the responsibility of the political structure under which he functions. So this does not seem to be an entirely satisfactory answer either. Now we go along a little further in this problem and we discover that the children themselves break down into several different general classifications. Children are idealistic or materialistic because of qualities and characteristics within themselves. If in a parental society a child shows too much materialism, the parent will try to balance the situation. And if the child is overly theologically dominated, the parent again will try to change the situation. But with no restraint, the child then becomes a ward of the state and must follow all the mores of that social system. This being true, we have to fa face the effect of this on various generations to come. We have recognized in the last 25 or 35 years the tremendous rise of personal ambitions and personal determinations for individual success. We have also had this tremendous realization, this great leap into the future, as it has been called, long enough now to see a few of the consequences. And to use a simple statement, the great leap has fallen on its face. We are not getting the great advance that we've been talked about. We have been getting computerization, mechanization. We have been developing many criminal institutions. We have terrorists, fanatics, and a whole group of delinquencies that we thought were buried in Egypt or Greece 2,000 years ago. But they're with us still. And there seems to be this amazing situation of the country, Europe, the, the civilized nations of the world fully capable of thinking, who are absolutely unaware or completely overwhelmed by the present situation. They do not know what to do. They keep on going along their old ways. They are going to keep right on moon shooting or whatever it may be. But beneath them and in their social system, society is in trouble. It is in serious trouble a trouble that is going to affect the health of future generations. We are producing more and more parents who are developing serious neurotic tendencies. And we are producing more children who are born neurotics and will develop the situation more and more. Now if we go to reincarnation as a factor in this, we come upon an interesting possibility 
These difficult children that come into the world, and nearly all families have a few of them, these difficult children are here to get over the difficulty. They are here to realize that their attitudes must either be constructive or they are going to suffer. The difficult child is in need of enlightenment. The difficult child will never succeed by nursing the difficulty. If he is selfish and no one changes this attitude, he will wreck his own career and probably blight several generations who may come after him. Everything that is wrong in him, that is here, he has an opportunity to study firsthand. There are very few vice-written people today who are not surrounded by other vice-written people. They all can see what is happening to their neighbors, their relatives, their associates, their countries, and their world. They must realize that we are all in serious trouble. But to them, or at least to many, uh, there are various evasions. One of the most common evasions we have in life is the evasion of not thinking about it, just simply overlooking the whole thing, taking it for granted that it's impossible, taking it for granted that we are impossible, and taking for granted that the answer is going to be that the impossible will reap its own harvest. All this means to many young people, particularly in the drug addicts field, that now is the only moment in which you can do what you please. You can be happy even if it's drug ridden. But the idea of sobering up, there is no incentive for it. And by the time the individual wakes up, He's in a terrible situation himself, and his community is in a worse situation. Now, some way, we have to get at the problems here and see what we can do about it. I think that the real answer to the whole thing has always rested in the fact that no nation has ever survived without some kind of a spiritual moral code. This code may appear to be... uh, inadequate, and looking back upon other nations, uh, we are inclined to regard their godlings as merely superstitious inventions. If that is true, we have one other point to remember, namely that our present condition and what we regard and respect is also a superstitious belief. The way we are living is no improvement over the various hierarchies of deities available to our ancestors. All of them had one thing in common. There was a rule that somebody had to keep. And there was a power that could demand the fulfillment and obedience to that rule. By becoming completely materialistic, we have removed the need for change in ourselves. We are determined, therefore, to view life as a single episode extending from the cradle to the grave, and that during this period of life, the supreme achievement, the ultimate success, is to have fun. One of the reasons why we should have fun is because we're not sure there's any place afterwards that's going to be fun. In fact, we're not sure there's going to be anything. But, and uh, as one said uh, to me not long ago, a rather curious statement, he said to me, he said, you know, uh, I'm not sure that I'll even have a memory after I leave this world. Maybe I cease. But if I have a memory, I hope it'll be a memory of the good things I had here. Well, if the, if the materialist is right, he's not going to remember the good things he had here more than he remembers anything. Therefore, there is no future in a materialistic philosophy. And there is a tendency now for the world in general to be infected with the no future attitude in which there is no use trying because it makes no difference in the end. However, there's another point on this even the materialist has a difficulty with. 
No matter how materialistic we are and how much we deny the reality of ethics, we still fa face the realization that while we may not go on, we are leaving behind us generations to come. We are leaving children, grandchildren. We are leaving destinies to go to pieces because of the stupidity of our present points of view. If there is no future for the individual, there is certainly to be remembered that his children and their children have a right to some kind of a world. And if he wrecks this world before they grow up, everybody is going to be worse off. All this then comes right straight back to how are we going to bend the twig. The idea that the parent is going to do it is becoming, in the, for the most part, inadequate. It may well be that an occasional family will have a tremendous strength. I've known such families. They could face a universal deluge without one moment thought of compromising their principles. But such consistency, such integrity, and such devotion is comparatively rare. What we have more, uh, more likely in this situation is that the person tries for a little while finds nothing but obstacles and either gives up and renounces his objectives or else stays on and remains a martyr. This type of situation is not the answer. So the way in which the twig is bent comes finally back to the law that we all have to face. We are all looking for some kind of a structure, a pattern, a policy which will enable us to achieve our purposes without major changes in ourselves. Such a policy does not exist, and never has, and never will. The individual must now take over his own destiny. He is going to be forced by circumstances to think through the problems of his own existence. He knows when he starts out in life uh, that he makes mistakes. He realizes in childhood that what he does wrong. As he gets a little older, he may have an occasional contact with law and order and learn things. He gets on the campus of a school and he will be tempted with every fallacy of the day. And he's going to see child after child fall apart. He's going to get up to the college level, university level, and find that he is in the midst uh, of a Babylonian situation. Nothing but trouble, misery, exploitation, and dissipation. So, if he hasn't strength enough to rise to some of these values, then he is not learning anything from his own examples and from what he learns. Now, there are ways he could learn, but there's a conspiracy against him. It's perfectly possible for him to learn a great deal from good reading. But books now are largely written to sell, not to teach. And they're not going to put anything in that is going to bar a customer from accepting the book. Instead of being told the facts of life, they are going to be told what we are supposed to do to maintain the status in quo. We may be told how bad everything is, but we are not told that it is in our power to do anything about it. There's always this process in which a great world movement has to save us. Now we can begin very carefully looking over the causes of our own immediate problem. And this applies to persons of all age group. Any child young enough or old enough to sit in front of a TV and any person who, of advancing years who is able to sit in the background and watch the TV is going to be deprived of integrities. He is going to have a conditioning that is basically wrong. He is going to be taught the glory of crime or he is going to be taught that the most important emotion is po that possible in him is excitement and the path platforms and the programs must become more violent every moment. He will find all these things catering 
to his failings rather than to his accomplishments. Instead of building him in strength, it is going to cater to the most selfish and useless factors of his personality. The same is almost certainly going to be true in higher education. He is not going to be taught what is necessary for him to know, and that is that his destiny is in his own keeping. He has the right to grow, and he also has the privilege of falling apart. He must decide for himself. It's not necessary for anyone to tell him. He can see it. The great textbook is open to him, where he can actually see among his own friends, his family, his community, the forces operating upon society. He knows perfectly well that he shouldn't drive a car under the influence of liquor. Well, he drives the car. And in so, in so doing, not only breaks law, but because of his own attitude, creates resentment in him against law. For if he is wrong, no one is supposed to interfere with the privilege of doing exactly what he pleases. So a world now dedicated to doing what it pleases is pleasing to do the wrong things. And out of it must have the consequences we look for. Now, if we have young people growing up, anyone, say, between the ages of about five or four, and young people up to 90 or 95, <laughs> the process of growing starts now. The idea of the twig being bent is no longer referable to the juvenile. The individual has a bent twig whenever he fails to make the adjustments necessary to maintain his integrity. When he surrenders to certain negative attitudes in his own life and in his own policies, he is bending the twig even though he may be far past the normal bending age. He may feel that this bending has been done in childhood, but a bad habit nursed through maturity will bend him just as badly and just as quickly. Whenever anything arises that isn't good for him, and he endures it, uh, and maybe appreciates it, and glorifies it, he is getting into trouble. So, at some level in life, perhaps after an, an unhappy educational experience, and for most students it is an unhappy experience, he may go out into the great world and realize of a sudden that he is completely unequipped. He doesn't know anything that's going to help him to build a life. He may be able to drop into a fairly remunerative slot somewhere in industry. He might become the third vice president of something just after graduating cum laude from the university. But six months later the firm he's in will fold up that he start all over again. Or the changing policy will eliminate the technical skill which he has spent 17 or 18 years acquiring, and he has to start over again. All of the ways of life as we know are based upon patterns of constant change in which an individual who cannot change as rapidly as his times is simply left behind. So per each person has to begin to think through and see what it's all about and see what he can do with his own personal character to see how much selfishness is influencing his daily life. And when he finds that out, he has graduated in one course at least. And it doesn't make any difference really whether he was told this and the example was given to him by a loving father and mother. Or if he did not have such attentions, then he's going to find it, or have to find it, when he's 20, 30, 40, or 50 which it is un unable to withstand. It is bent when it gradually nurses a mistake. As we go on year after year, without, in, without changing our points of view, without rising above some limitations of ourselves, 
we have the right to ask ourselves a simple question. If we reach 50 years of age, how much better are we as human beings than we were at 20? How much real integrity have we built in? Have we sacrificed a great deal of personal advantage to maintain some collective security? Are we passing through one divorce after another? Or have we gradually learned to solve these difficulties? A solution always straightens out a bent twig. But if we just keep on having bends in the twig and nothing is done about it, there is no solution and we continue to make the same mistake indefinitely. We continue to suffer for it indefinitely but we can declare this is our right because we are free agents to do as we please. And we're going to do as we please regardless of consequences. Now life has to change this for us. And it will. Of course it may take a little longer than we expect because we're not changeable in most of the good things. All our changes seem to be changes that lose ground rather than advance causes. But even if it takes another 25 lives to do it, we are going to get over it. And we're going to get over the things which in actual, factual, personal experience hurt us. We're going to realize that things that we want will destroy us unless we stop wanting them. Things that we need and must have will not be present until we stop evading them. Everything that is necessary should be available to a mature mind. We do not need to be educated out of the power to think. And we can be so over-educated in delusions that we are no longer capable of straight thinking. Under those conditions, we have an academic uh, twig-bending procedure and the individual uh, graduates from a great institution with so many limitations and restrictions upon his judgment that he can scarcely be expected to amount to much of anything in the present embodiment. He just can't make it. But all this is foolish. And we're getting gradually to the point where the folly is becoming unbearable. We're not able to stand this much longer. So it's very encouraging to find everywhere springing up individuals determining to change things for the better. There has been a great increase in interest in religion in the last 50 years, and much of that religion has been free from the negative purgatorial emphases of past generations. Religion is now being looked more and more, or regarded more and more, as a constructive force in our careers. It is to do something to help us. It is not a, a system to frighten us out of our vices, but to inspire us into our virtues. The purpose of religion is to build positive life, not uh, to bind individuals to various denominational fundamentalisms. But religion is here. There's been a tremendous extension in it. It has spread from one part of the world to another, and religion today is de developing a very interreligious structure. We are beginning to appreciate the faiths of other people. We begin to realize that people on the other side of the earth have good beliefs also. And gradually we may reach the point where instead of thinking of the people on the other side of the earth, we gradually come to notice that our next door neighbor has a religion worth considering. That tolerance in religious matters is a virtue. Intolerance is a mess for all concerned. Little by little, the individual can lift himself out of his own doldrums. He can gradually observe and measure and weigh the direct consequences of his own policies. Now, this may, in some cases, be a little disillusioning, but now uh, there is a growing school of psychology which is no longer trying to explain simply the Freudian concepts. There is a form of psychology that is working on the t total person. 
determined to find the limitations, restrictions, and bends that are influencing mature lives into pain and sorrow, sickness and death. It is becoming more and more realized that the, each individual must make these attainments for himself. If he has had a good background in family, wonderful. If he has an inspiring education, in spite of all the prevailing problems, wonderful. If he has a job he likes and is doing well in it, good. If he has a family in which he has good, uh, children that are growing up beautifully and a close family life, wonderful. All these things are to the good, but they are not as numerous as we would like to have them. They are the exception rather than the rule. Now some homes are ruined because of stubbornness. One member of a marriage can wreck it by simple stubbornness. And unless that person changes, the future is pretty nearly hopeless. There are all kinds of things that rise in the person. What are these values that can build or ruin? Well, you can say for one thing, each person can just ask himself right now, child or adult, are you happy? And I, when we say, are you happy? We don't mean, are you chuckling over a joke or listening to a, te a television comedian? We say, are you happy because you are living a kind of life that fulfills you? Are you doing the things that you know are ne necessary? Have you the happiness of a good close family or the happiness of a great self-sacrifice as in the case of Mother Teresa? Are we happy because we're doing good? Are we happy because we're unfolding potentials? Are we happy because we are contributing to happiness and well-being for other people? Are we happy? Are we always able to meet these things? Are we doing in, jump, in just and simple manner the majority of things that are necessary to our security? Can we live without fear and die with hope? Is the world in, its, in, our, in our relationship with it something we'd like to help, but something that we're not going to be ensnared by in the terms of the perversion of the integrities of life? So if we uh, want to know about that, we can begin to think about it a little bit. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to think about these things. We can say to ourselves, I, I wish I didn't quite have that sharp a temper. I get a little irritated on something and then I blow my top. And uh, I know people who are proud of it. And they're so proud of it they want everyone they know to hear the explosion. <laughs> but in reality, what have they done? They've simply scattered misery in the atmosphere. The, uh, ex the explosion probably solved nothing it may have been one of the factors that ultimately led to the, led to the dissolution of a marriage. Uh, is the person content to live comfortably? And if he has a reasonable living, how is he using it and what is he doing about it? If he is comfortable, if he is, has enough to take care of himself and his loved ones, if he has enough to do a few simple things that bring him pleasure, and his pleasures are constructive, then he is probably almost an ideally happy person. He is happy because he doesn't want things that are beyond his reach. He is happy because he has let go of things that he didn't need anymore. And he's happy because his environment is at peace and he is at peace with himself and those who are near and dear to him. Now this kind of happiness is shattered by almost any form of extraordinary ambition. The individual who cannot be happy unless he is famous, wealthy, and high office, and generally admired, is always going to be miserable. 
And no matter what happens, even if he gets to the very height that he aspires to, he's going to find that he has only been raised to a greater misery. He will find that immoderation in ambitions, uh, selfishness in monetary matters, the acceptance of wealth as the final security in life, all these things are loaded with pain. They're not loaded only just with economic and mental pain, but in the achieving of these various ends, he has probably wrecked his constitution and shortened his life and burdened the latter years of living with sickness and pain. The moment the individual does not adjust gently and quietly to normalcy until he finds the ultimate wisdom of the words of Socrates, in all things not too much. Unless he realizes these and knows it and lives according to it, he's in trouble. This is the, one of the reasons why we have so much wealth in the wrong hands today. We have people who are more wealthy than they need to be and more miserable than they would be with far less material goods. So this is something you have to move in on. Move in and decide what kind of a life you want to live. Then another thing you have to decide is what kind of a job do you want? What is your real thought about this? Somewhere inside of yourself, nearly you and nearly everyone else, has some kind of an impulse, an aspiration, a desire, a, a sensitive area which would stand developing. But very often today, the uh, education of the individual very carefully avoids this. We find a young man who maybe would like to spend the two or three years in the Peace Corps or do something of this nature with his life. And a family that is dying of a broken heart because he isn't going to be a lawyer. So they make a lawyer out of him anyway. And all through his life, he has this pain, this insecurity, this unfulfilled desire. I remember one case I mentioned before, but it's long ago, so maybe it'll stand repetition. I knew a clergyman, a very devout, honorable minister. He had always wanted to be a sea captain. He didn't want to be a minister. He acknowledged that if he was a sea captain, he might be able to occasionally perform a wedding or a funeral right on the boat. But he really wanted to be a sea captain. And being the thought of being a sea captain broke his parents' heart. Everything was done to prove to him that it was not a genteel uh, profession. His father wanted him to be a lawyer, and his mother wanted him to be a minister. They wanted to fulfill themselves some way in him. So he became a minister. And he was a good one. And he uh, was con very conscientious and so on. And on the mantle in the study of his church was a model ship. He had two more ship models at home. He made these models also from kits and gave them to children and other people. And finally, at the end of a long career, he retired. And the first thing that he did when he retired was to buy a sailing boat and go around the coast of the United States. He never got over what he wanted to be, but they wouldn't let him. Now, it's way possible that his mother was right. He was far more useful, perhaps, as a minister. But within himself, there was a psychological illness, which he never got over. He was a person who was constantly burdened with this sense of depression, a weight on himself. And, as might be expected, after a few years of sailing around his boat, a stroke and an invalidism for the rest of his life. The man was not permitted to do what he wanted to do. And what, what he wanted to do was honest and hurt no one and gave him a fulfillment of something maybe that he brought with him out of the past. 
he shouldn't be, dis be discouraged co completely in trying to let loose the pressure within his own nature, as long as that pressure was good. We find all kinds of things of this type, kind. We realize that nearly all the great artists of history were self-made. They were painted because they had to paint. They, were, they painted because of a genius locked within them. Gradually, however, something happened. Many of these artists became associated with the courts of Italy and Germany and France, later in England, and became court painters. As soon as this happened, something else happened. The quality of art began to deteriorate because they were no longer painting because they loved to paint, but because they became a member of an imperial court and were the painter for the sovereign. This was, it became a detached, a degeneration of art. And of course, the worst generation of all is an art which is concerned solely with selling the product. These things are wrong. And while they don't necessarily seem to be so wrong, or make such a big show of their own uselessness, you will find the people who have made these compromises that they have sacrificed their integrities for some reward. If you go into their lives, you will find they all had a bad time. They had a bad time because nothing could prevent them from escape, escaping from pressure through excess. If they had not had the pressure of frustration, if they'd been allowed to do the things that they wanted to do, they probably would have had happy lives and lived in general contented people. But the only place where you will find contentment to any degree at the present time is in the me medium distance, neither the wealth nor the poverty, but a security based upon simple tastes, reasonable desires, and the right use of assets. These are the things that come the nearest to being what we must have. Now in the course of the problem also we come against uh, the health equation. We must realize, I think, that there is a justice in nature and that when the moment we break these rules something goes wrong. Now you will find in many instances uh, that the health problem is also closely associated with the breaking of natural laws. The individual who lives simply, lives moderately, and lives within a pattern of common sense usually has the greatest opportunity and probability of survival. He will live longer if he is not bound into a complex within himself. If he is doing the simple things of life and doing them well, if he's busy, if he is contented to work reasonably, he will find accordingly a proper recognition. This is now moving into the, the women in business. The woman in business has exactly the same responsibilities. The first question she must ask herself is why? Why have I given up the natural problems of a woman to take on a business career? Is it because I want to have more leisure? Is it because we want to build a higher standard of living? Is it that we want to have more money and do things we want to do? Or is it because inside of myself there isn't something in me that wants to express itself as an individual. I want to be a painter. I want to be a musician. I want to do what I want to do because of a feeling I've had from infancy. Under those conditions, the failure to do this is a disaster. But the accomplishment of a career for a purpose that is not reasonable, honorable, and within integrities if it is a sacrifice to others, and if it is a failure to be the person they should be, then the price is too high. 
everyone has a right to correct his own faults during the course of a lifetime. And I might add, however, not get too optimistic because not many people are going to solve all of theirs in any lifetime. It's going to go on indefinitely because most people, when they start solving problems, make new ones. We have a knack of going on a bias wherever we go. We can seldom go from A to B on a straight line. So that uh, we have to realize that we have a whole group of ailments and new ailments arising every day in which nature is pointing out very firmly that there are things we cannot do without injuring ourselves. We are having a great fight over the cigarette problem at the moment. And we're having groups that insist that they are being interfered with, that they have a right to do as they please, that they have no right to have someone else legislate for them. Well, from a political standpoint, maybe they have a case. But as far as nature is concerned, nature has no interest in all of these rights or privileges. Nature says if you do something that's unhealthy, you'll be unhealthy. And that's all there is to it. And the Civil Liberties Union can't do a thing about it. <laughs> we are going to do what we want to do. And the censorship is not a stroke from heaven. It is not the animosity of our associates. It is not the fact that our boss doesn't like it or that our children move out on it. The very basic fact is, if we do these things that are not what they should be, we'll be sick. Now this sickness can be very, very serious. And wealth is one of the greatest causes of ulcers that there is. Most uh, well, very wealthy people are sick, not only in ordinary ways, but in physical ways. In the last years of his life, John D. Rockefeller Sr. had to live on milk and toast. His digestion was completely wrecked. Now, it doesn't follow that it was wrecked by his diet. He may have been abstemious all his life, but it was wrecked by the weight of his mind disturbing and destroying the digestive system of the body. Worries, fears, anxieties, the great mergers, the tremendous emphasis on this and that things which have no essential value in life can destroy health. So one thing you have to realize is that you, that's, that's one problem the lawyer can't get you out of. It's the one problem that cannot be arbitrated. You cannot make some kind of a special assignment to do as you please and get away with it. The moment a law is broken there are only two as possible terminations. The natural disaster resulting from the broken law or the wisdom to go back on the path and stay out of trouble. These are the only decisions. Everything in nature is regulated by the laws of survival. And these laws of survival have been outraged since the dawn of time. Survival has been endangered to the ambitions of countless millions. Survival has been sacrificed to ignorance, superstition, and fear. It has been the curse of ambition. It has destroyed the brotherhood of man and denied the fatherhood of God. So all these things, the legislating them is going to be very difficult because no one wants to be legislated to do something he doesn't feel like doing. And anyone who tries to do this type of thing is subject to all kinds of criticism and even legal action. But there's no one that can stop you, or wants to stop you really, from growing yourself. You do it quietly, it offends no one, and the worst that they can say about you is that you're more generous, thoughtful, and kind than you ever were before. Therefore, very few people object to the growth of someone else. 
but they object to being told that another person is growing and then that person doing all the old things that were wrong. And the person himself has to come face to face with this, that he has to break the habits which not only b bent his twig in the first place, but keeping it bended and bending it a little more as he goes along until finally in the end it breaks. This bending of the twig goes on as long as we nurse any intensity of purpose. If the intensity is beautiful, noble, generous, then the twig, uh, even though it may be a little bent, will have some pretty leaves and flowers grow on it. But if it is something in which we are nursing faults because we like them, if we are worrying because worry we regard as a symbol of dignity, a worrier is a sincere, serious citizen. <laughs> and uh, the fact is worrying is not going to do any good. That's too bad, but that's somebody else's fault. But worry in itself is not solutional. If a person sees something or comes in contact with something that needs change or needs correction, the simple thing to do is to get to work and change it. Now, if it's someone else, you're going to be in trouble, but nature doesn't want you to turn on other people. Nature wants you to recognize the world around you as a great textbook and that you yourself, as the Rosicrucians said, uh, each of us is an ABC Darian in this college of the Holy Spirit. We are here to go to the great school of experience. And we must all, one way or another, graduate from the University of Hard Knocks, which is one of the highest colleges that there is in the world. <laughs> Harvard and Yale, nothing in comparison to Hard Knocks as a basis of growth, of actual development of integrity. But wherever there's a Hard Knock, you do not simply lie down and hurt. You wonder why. You think about it. You realize that in most cases, the mistake is in yourself, but blamed on someone else. You have misjudged someone, you have catered to something because it seemed to be a little more satisfactory, you've compromised principles for convenience. All kinds of little things have added up to make a life that is no longer in harmony with the divine plan. Now as we get along further and further in this, and uh, we are now going to start in on the, our next billion inhabitants. We are gradually growing in population, even in spite of the fact that families are not as large as they used to be. But we are still going along into the future uh, with a problem of population growth, a problem of taking care of hunger and suffering, a problem of better governments and all these types of things. We are on the verge of a reorganization of life. A new world order has to come into being. And if we are interested in growth, we can change with joy. If we are not interested in growth, every change can be a torture. Everything that breaks the old pattern of our mistakes can hurt. And anything new that we're not acquainted with or not really very much interested in is a disaster. So everyone has to adjust themselves to a, an attitude that is suitable to his own future. We find people uh, with uh, the same tendencies in retirement. When they retire, they think how wonderful it's going to be, and in a short time they have to find new interests, or retirement is impossible. In the future, we may say, civilization must retire. Sometime this way of life that we know is going to reach its maximum endurance, and something has to give. Now, when the time comes for a civilization to retire, let it be in the same way as a well-integrated person. Let that civilization become an, an elder statesman for the rest of the world, 
let it leave behind it so much of good example and good precept and so much of basic integrity that the new world order can build firmly upon it, realizing that it is building upon the strength of the ages. It, we don't want to really see a world order blown off the planet or just simply fall apart because of political corruption and leaving nothing but a bad taste behind it. We in the same with ourselves. Yeah, I believe firmly uh, in the doctrine of reincarnation. I don't expect to uh, uh, finish anything here. But I do wish to leave it just a little better here than it was when I got here. Maybe just a little bit. But also I realize that this is all part of the process of learning how to help. I've spent 65 years now trying to find out how to help. And I found that the best way I know to help is by example. By trying to help people to help themselves, but not trying to do it for them. There are all kinds of organizations floating around that are right ready to save you at the slightest provocation. But each individual in the long run must save himself. So if you have a crooked branch on your tree, you are the one that's going to have to straighten it. Now when you start to straighten a branch that's been bent for a long time, you have to be rather careful because the branch may be a little brittle and break and that won't help too much. But with care and thoughtfulness, a live branch can gradually be bent until it goes the direction you want it to go. And this, this, uh, each of us keeps on building stronger, constructive attitudes. We can become branch benders in a major way. And the habits of 10 years of mistakes can be corrected by 20 years of proper living. We can learn to do the things that will save us from the consequences of the things we did before. In a sense, this is education. Because education, even though it is on the human level, is not so different from the education of a well-regulated rabbit family, or almost any animal or bird. Because all the little ones learn from experience. They watch, they observe, they are warned by secret methods that we don't know anything about. But the great education that they all have to learn is keep the rules or perish. The moment the little animal doesn't do what is proper for its survival, it ceases. And as Seton used to say, there are very, very few animals in the wild state that ever die of old age. They nearly all die because somewhere along the line uh, they made a mistake. They were not quite strong enough in keeping. Sometimes hunger became so great that they were too courageous and died in the search of food. Some of them died to get food for their young. But when the simple laws of life were broken, then you have either death or martyrdom. And you have people who die for the good of others. This is quite possible. And in a sense, it is better to die for the good of another than to live on for the ill in ourselves. So all these things work together. But each person has the, the possibility of taking the life as it is around him and studying it. Not to tell other people or ask other people but to observe his own personal life. We don't like to think of people writing their own autobiographies, but there's no reason why they shouldn't recollect a few things occasionally just as thoughts in their own minds. Think back to the best thing that ever happened to you. Think back to the worst thing that ever happened to you. And gradually get out of your mind entirely the idea of chance or that there are opportunities that are unjust, or that there are miracles. Paracelsus the von Hauenheim wants to define miracles in a very simple way. He says, if we think of miracles, there is no such a thing. But a miracle is an effect, the cause of which must be equal to that effect, although this may not be uh, visible at any given time. 
But everything that happens is the result of a cause. And every cause produces an effect like itself. Violence produces violence. Peace produces peace. But there's nothing but a constant interplay of cause and effect. And the individual who causes no trouble will be plagued with no effect. It happens, however, he may be carrying a little baggage with him from previous embodiments that he has to live through. But in due time, if he does not add to his mistakes, he will survive them and rise above them. So we can take up to the day we die this problem of straightening out this crooked branch. And even on our deathbeds, we can hold it rather tightly and straighten it in the right direction so it will be headed where we want it to go in the next embodiment. We're going to have to gradually take over our own destiny and live it according to natural wisdom. And sometime education will have to give us the most important gift that it can give us. And that is insight into universal processes insight into the natural educational power of the universe the purpose of which is always the same to bring to perfection all of the crea creations and creatures which it has fashioned study the neighbor study ourselves study the universe and with the right outlook the right understanding we will learn to make the corrections in ourselves that will enable us to go peacefully through the years of life enjoying it in a deep and quiet way and free from most of its impediments and impairments. Well, that's it.